Hello? Uh, good evening. Uh, today we will be singing Walking in Sunlight number 708. Yes. Mike is on. Uh, today we will be singing number 708, Walking in Sunlight. Again, that's number 708, Walking in Sunlight. Let's sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Alleluia. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, Flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Uh, the next song we will be singing is number 717, Victory in Jesus. We will be singing the first and the third verses. Again, that is number 717, Victory in Jesus, the first and the third verses. Let us sing. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save the wretch like me. I heard about his groanings, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. <coughs> oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Uh, please mark your hymn books number 255.
Good evening. It is April 3rd. Hopefully you made it through April 1st all right without getting uh, too many jokes played on you. Uh, but we're in April, so that means tax day's coming up. Not, not everybody jump up and down at once. Um, <clears throat> so I figured I'd give you a few uh, quotes or some one-liners that I found up for, for taxes and tax day. Uh, to lighten the mood a little. So, the income tax has made liars out of more Americans than golf, is one. Uh, another guy says, on my income tax 1040, it says, check this box if you are blind. I wanted to put a check mark about three inches away. <laughs> Worried about an IRS audit? Avoid what's called a red flag. That's something the IRS always looks for. For example, say you have some money left over in your bank account after paying taxes. That's a red flag. <laughs> that was Jay Leno, by the way. Um, <laughs> I just taught my kids about taxes by eating 38% of their ice cream. <laughs> According to a recent survey, 12% of Americans say that it's fine to cheat a little on your taxes, while the other 88% know not to talk to a guy with a clipboard asking him if they cheat on their taxes. <clears throat> Uh, people who complain about paying their income tax can be divided into two types, men and women. Um, I put all my money into taxes. They're the only thing that's sure to go up. Uh, if early colonists thought that taxation without representation was bad, they should see how bad it is with representation. Uh, the U.S. Senate is considering a bill that would tax Botox. When the Botox users heard this, they were horrified. Well, I think they were horrified. It was difficult to tell. <laughs> uh, I figured out why Uncle Sam wears such a tall hat. It comes in handy when he passes it around. That was Soupy Sales. And uh, the last one I got, intoxication is a new term. Intoxication is the ni that nice feeling you get when you receive a tax refund until you realize it was your own money in the first place. So a few things on taxes. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about that because I was uh, doing my taxes this week. And uh, there's five different ways you can file, five different statuses you can file as a, uh, a tax filer. You'd be single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, head of household, or a qualifying widower with dependent child. Those are the five different ways that the U.S. government allows you to file taxes. For most of those, other than single, you can have a dependent. You can, you can claim dependents. <clears throat> so I was getting on this idea of dependents, and some of the qualifications for a dependent, I was thinking how they could relate uh, to us and God and, and our dependence on God or how we should be uh, dependent on God. So for tax reasons, a dependent, uh, and this is for, uh, taken from a few tax websites, a dependent is a person who relies on someone else for financial support and can include children or other relatives. And a scripture I found for that, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So we need to rely on someone else. If we are going to be dependents, if we are going to be considered dependents, dependents of God, then we should rely on him and not try to uh, direct things ourselves. Uh, uh, one of the other uh, characteristics, um, uh, any person who filed, uh, files a joint return cannot be claimed as a dependent on anyone else's tax return. So as Christians, we ought not be able to be dependents of anyone else. And uh, I will refer you to, I got these marked in, in random locations. <clears throat> Luke 16, 13, also in, in Matthew 6, 24. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, a new verse for you. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you can only be filed as a dependent in one place. Uh, to be claimed as a dependent, a person must be a U.S. citizen, U.S. resident, alien, U.S. national, or a resident of Canada or Mexico. So you have to be a resident somewhere. You have to be a resident uh, of the United States uh, or apparently Canada or Mexico. That was the first time I'd seen that. But 
uh, Romans um, chapter 8. I'll direct you to Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. Um, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many of you are as led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him, that we may be also glorified, uh, that we also may be glorified together. So we have to be part of God. To be a dependent of his, we got to be part of uh, we got to be part of his family. And it says if we, uh, if we bear with him, <clears throat> then we will be called his children. Uh, a couple more. you got to have uh, a relationship. One of the relationship uh, factors for being a uh, qualified as a dependent is to be a son, daughter, stepchild, eligible foster child, brother, sister, half-sister, or half-brother, stepbrother, stepsister, adopted child, or the child of one of these. You have to be a child. 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 29 uh, through 3, 1. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it does not know him. We are children of God. And we should live like we're dependents of God. We should depend on him and not try to do everything ourselves, but consult with him. One of the things that, that caught my mind that, that popped in my head was Joshua 9.14. <clears throat> when the Gibeonites had come, and the Gibeonites were, uh, they knew, this was when Joshua was taking over the promised land, <clears throat> and they knew that they were going to get conquered. They knew they were going to be destroyed. So they came up with this plan, and they approached Joshua as if they came from this faraway land to make a treaty with him. And one of the things it says in Joshua 9.14 is that he did not consult with God and end up making the treaty with them. And that was one of the things that ended up causing their demise because God's intent was for them to destroy everybody. He didn't consult with God, and then bad things happened. We need to be consulting with God, um, putting our life in his hands. Uh, We spent the weekend in uh, Orlando for Lads to Leaders, And the theme this year, and I mentioned it uh, last Wednesday, was I am not ashamed. And we should not be ashamed. Considering this lesson, we should not be ashamed to be dependent of God. We should not be ashamed to be considered part of his family. We should not be ashamed uh, to call on him, to pray for things, uh, and and ask for his his help, his guidance, and his direction uh, because we need it. We need it, and we need to be a part of his family because that's the only way we can get into heaven. If you have any uh, needs this evening, if you need to come forward, we have elders here, we have deacons here, we have members here who are willing to, uh, to receive you, to help you, uh, pray with you. We come now as Andrew leads us in the song. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free, hasten glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the path of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, Still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, 
great is highest, I will come to thee. So I have a few announcements um, before we get led to our class. Um, Lee Blackshear has been released from the hospital and is recovering at home. We need to continue to remember um, Judy partially as she still continues to deal um, with the pains that she goes through each day. Um, let's continue to remember her. Also continue to remember Dwayne and Cindy Bennett in your prayers. Bobby Damarama, she has spent some days in hospital, but she's back home. Let's uh, remember her. Continue to remember John Martinez's niece, Cora Gonzalez. Um, did you have a relative in an accident, David? All right, how is he doing? He's in rehab. Let's remember, you said Jerry Willis? Jerry Willis, um, an uncle of Dave Rogers, he was in a wreck. Let's remember him. Hand and foot, there will be a hand and foot game um, at the Morris's home on April the 13th. Um, you can sign up on the bulletin board if you would like to attend uh, that particular event. I don't have a time, do we anybody know the time? No, we don't know a time, okay. Maybe there's a time on the bulletin board, um, but um, that's happening on April 13th. Mount Dora Benefit Dinner is going to be Friday, April 5th, 6.30 at UNF. I mean, it's going to be at the Adam Herbert University Center. Um, is it too late to have tickets, to get tickets? So if they haven't got the tickets, it's done? Okay. Um, the Monday morning ladies Bible class will begin Monday, April the 8th, 10 o'clock here at the building. We'll be looking at Revelations. Um, Ladies Bible Study, Hope Grows, Chapter 7, will be reviewed on Monday, April 8th at 6.30 at the church building. That's all the announcements I have. Um, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed to our class. Most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now in prayer, thankful for the many blessings that we have. We know everything we have, we have because of you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you be with the ones that were mentioned tonight. Ask that you be with um, Jerry Willis, um, David's uncle, who was in a wreck, asked as he's going through rehab, Dean Father, that you be with him. Ask that you continue to be with Judy partially and what she deals with each day, Dean Father. I ask that you please just ease her pain. I ask that you be with Lee Blackshear as he's recovering. Um, I ask that you continue to be with him. I ask that you be with Dwayne and Cindy Bennett. Continue to be with both of them, Dean Father. I ask that you continue to be with Bobby Don Rama, continue to be with her. I ask that you also will be with Cora Gonzalez, dear Heavenly Father. I ask that you be with us um, tonight in our class, that we um, can learn some things, dear Heavenly Father, that, will, that we can apply in our daily life. As we go through our lives, dear Heavenly Father, let us all shroud to bring honor and glory to your name and all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seems like a while since we've had a class, or a class that, um, the class that we've been doing. But tonight's the last one. Go ahead, you can be happy. No. Um, tonight's the last one, last class for the quarter. 
Um, after tonight, Jerry will be um, beginning next quarter, next Wednesday, looking at the Philippian church um, and looking at God's family, our theme, um, God's family. So that will be the study on that. This coming up Sunday, I believe David Compton will begin the Sunday. You're done, right, David? Um, this particular, this coming up Sunday, David Compton will begin our Sunday morning class. Um, and so David Compton will be doing Sunday morning, Jerry will be doing a Wednesday night. Um, and so uh, we're excited about those upcoming classes. I believe David is in Corinthians. I believe that's where he's at. Um, if you didn't get a book, make sure you grab one on the way out the door. Um, get study on that and provide him with a lot of tough questions. That's my challenge to each of you today, tonight is make David's quarter tough and challenging on him, okay? Uh, Come up with some good questions for him. Uh, I want to see him sweat a little bit, okay? I want to see David sweat a little bit. Um, So, anyways, with that being said, we had two chapters left in this book. We're going to go and we're going to get through both chapters tonight so we can say that we completed this book um, on building adult godly leaders tonight. The two chapters, one chapter is on cultivating a culture, and the other chapter is on being accountable. Um, And so we'll look at both of these tonight. I got 35 minutes. We are going to get this done in 34 minutes and 30 seconds. All right? You like how I come up with that, right? I'm going to get you all 30 seconds early tonight. All right, Val? Just for you, buddy. Um, So anyways, cultivating a culture. How important is a culture in a work environment. Is it, is it important? What happens when there is a bad culture? How is productivity? Is it where it needs to be? What's so funny? Did I say something wrong? All right. No, it's not where it needs to be. It's important that, that you have a great culture. And it's the same thing within the church. You can walk into a business, you can walk into a, you know, I'll I'll speak on education because I've been in it for so long. You can walk into a school and just within five minutes of starting to talk to people there between teachers and and just people there, you can kind of tell what the culture is like in that school. If people are miserable, if teachers are miserable because there are bad leaders, you can tell what the culture is like. Same thing in the business world. I'm sure that if you go to a public supermarket and, and it is run badly by a store manager who is over the entire store, um, I can tell you right now, that trickles down, right? It trickles down to the other managers, in which, the, in which those managers that trickle it down to their associates, and the customers oftentimes might feel, um, okay, this is maybe not uh, 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 where shopping is a pleasure, okay? Um, and so, so, but you can also see it and tell within a church. When you come into the doors of a church, how many of you have ever visited a congregation and when you visited that congregation, as you came in, you sat down. Um, let's say maybe you got there a little early. You sat down. You sat through Bible class. You got them with Bible class. And, and you go and you sit through worship. And, and as that final amen goes, you get up and you leave. And not one single person said one word to you. Yeah. I mean... What kind of culture is that in the Lord's church, right? I mean, and so I can say this at this congregation. One of the things that we like the fellowship here. I believe we like the fellowship here. And I, and I believe that we, stri- we strive to, especially if we see a visitor, we do our best to, to go and speak to that visitor. I mean, a lot of times even before... Um, be, like in between that that Bible class and and in between Bible class and um, and worship service, I remember a couple weeks ago we had a, a couple from Minnesota, and I remember being back here trying to get something together, and David Rogers immediately came to me. Hey, talk to that couple up there. They're from David. They're from Minnesota. You might want to go talk to them. 
And, and so, and so, I mean, but we will find visitors and we will speak to visitors. We don't have a problem doing that. And I think when people come in here, they understand that, hey, when we come to Lake Forest, it's a friendly congregation. And that's the culture we want to have, right? We want to have a, a welcoming um, um, atmosphere here where people feel welcomed here. People feel like this is a place where they're going to, to feel loved, that they're going to feel welcome um, to come and worship God with you. Um, and so it's important that uh, we cultivate that type of culture um, um, here within the church, but it's also that way as, as, you, uh, and as, a, as you are a leader. As you look to lead organizations, as you look to lead the Lord's church, it's important that um, you cultivate that type of cult, um, culture. Um, so how can leaders help the people grow? And, and that's kind of the first part of this particular chapter. Uh, and so there's four things that the book talks about here on how people, um, how leaders can help people grow. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we want when we cultivate the culture. We want to have a culture where people are growing also, right? Um, um, even within the Lord's church, you want the members to constantly grow. It's important for the elders to put, um, um, the, find the right preachers, find um, the right people in, and, and, you know, one of the big tasks that, that Greg and Melissa have in our Sunday school, making sure that we put the right people in the right spots because do we not want those young people to grow? We want them to grow. And we got to continue to find the right people. We need people, right? And we want to continue to grow, and we want our congregation to grow more spiritually each day. Um, and so one of the things, the first thing that book talks about here in cultivating this particular culture, it says encourage everyone. Encourage everyone is the first thing. And so... One of the things it talks about here, when, when you encourage someone, when you're trying to be that, that adult godly leader, when you're, when you're that leader, whether it's, in a, whether it's in an organization, whether it's in the church, um, you need to, your people need to see you walk in the halls, basically. They need to get, they need to know you, right? They need to know that you are interested in them, right? It, do, it doesn't need to be one of these things where you're just walking by and, and you're saying hey, but you really aren't interested at all. You're just saying hey just to say hey and move on, right? It is taking an interest in those you lead. Because if you take an interest in those you lead, it's going to carry a lot of weight, is it not? It's going to carry a lot of weight. And so as we are being adult godly leaders, we need to make sure that we are encouraging others. And one of the ways that we encourage is taking an interest in those people that you're leading. Um, it's important for elders in the church to take an interest in its members, to know its members. To, to, if the members allow them to know what's going on, to, to do what they can for them. And for them to get the other, for the elders to get other people involved, getting our deacons involved. It's important for us to know um, our members and, 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 and be there for them. Second, it says here when it comes to encouraging others, it says that we need to encourage each person differently. You know, people, people I guess, um, you handle people differently at times. I mean, I know that when I coach ball, there's a player that maybe I can get all after, right, a certain way, and I know that's going to get them going. But uh, if I get that, that would be player A. But player B, if I did that same thing to player B, you know what happens to player B? She, she shuts down. I just lost her. Right? There, has to be, there might be a different way that I have to approach her. And that's with knowing your people. 
right? Knowing how um, to talk to them, knowing, knowing, knowing what way works best on how to get people motivated to do what they need to do, right? And so that's just knowing, knowing your people, right? At, at work, I have a lot of these young guys in my produce department, okay? And <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I hope and I pray that, that this generation, this young generation gets a little bit better, but the work ethic is not there, people. The work ethic is not there with this younger generation. All right? They don't want to work. They want to get in and they want to get out. If you can let them leave early, they're all about it. Okay? Um, but they don't want um, to, to get things done. And so some of the time, some of the things that I do to get them motivated, I do a little what I like to call Josh's reverse psychology on them. Okay? And here's my reverse psychology. The other day I have a, a, a young man, he's 19 years old, he's full time, he's a produce clerk, um, but he loves to talk. He's a talker. He, he wants to be right next to you, talking your ears off the entire time. Okay? There's a time to talk and there's a time to work, right? And so it was morning time. The produce truck came early. I was like, all right. I was, I'm not going to say his name, but all right, buddy. We're going to pull this truck out on the sales floor. We're, gonna, we're going to break it down. We're going to spot it, and we're going to work it. And, and, of course, it's like, oh, it ain't going to. I said, I said, I guarantee, I'm 47 years old, you're 19, I guarantee I can get this whole area right here done before you. That's my re reverse psychology. No, you can't, man. No, you can't. I guarantee I can. I can outwork you. I'm almost, what, 20, 30, 40, almost 30 years older than you, and I'm going to outwork you, man, right here. You know what he did? That boy worked so fast, he didn't know what he was doing. And I just sat back, and I loved every second. And we got that stuff done quick. And he said, I outworked you. I said, yeah, but I outsmarted you. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, I knew I could get you to work fast if I challenged you. Um, man, if I just added food in there, hey, if you outworked me, I'll feed you. Man, it, we would have been done an hour earlier but, um, because he loves to eat too. Um, but anyways... But it's, you have to know how, right, to, 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 um, to encourage people. And sometimes there's different ways that you encourage people, okay? Um, and so these are just some of the ways that it says here when it comes to encourage everyone, making sure people are encouraged. Um, the next point it says here, it says put people in their place. You want to put people in the right place to be successful, Right? You know, you look at the, the Bible, and, and as we look over there when it talks about the Lord's church, right? And it talks about the Lord's church, it talks about the body of Christ. And when we look at that description of the body of Christ, it tells us not everyone can be a hand, not everyone can be a foot. Y'all know the scripture I'm talking about, right? And, and so it's important that that people are placed in the right area, right? If somebody is, is, if somebody is not, their strengths might not be, for example, do you want Josh Schweringen to be over the maintenance of the building? Val, do you want me to be over the maintenance of the building? I knew Val would say yes because he has faith in me. He believes in me. Just by that, Val, you encourage me. I'm calling, you know what? Normally I would call you Barnabas because you're always encourager. Val, you are now Barnabas for this class. Son of encouragement right there. I feel like I can fix anything. If something breaks right now, y'all, I feel like I can fix it because of the encouragement of Val Kovalenko. I mean, I appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. But what was that? I appreciate that. Thank you for helping the team out here. Thank you for encouraging me. Um, but it's important that we put the people in the, in the right places, right, to be successful. In an organization, you want to make sure you put the right people in the right spots in that organization. And as, an, as, a, as a godly leader, that's one of your, the things that you're tasked with, is making sure you put people in the right spots, 
okay, in the organization. Also, though, another area it says that we, we can do is being vulnerable. Being vulnerable. What, what is that? What, why is that good as a leader? Why is that good as a leader? What? It makes you human. It makes you relatable. Okay? Anything else? Yeah. Allows your people to see that, to show that humility side of a leader, right? To show um, that a leader is, has humility. And people can get behind that, can't they? They can get behind somebody like that. Um, and so, and then last, when it comes to um, this idea of cultivating a culture, it says that you should always tell the truth. Always tell the truth. You know, as leaders, it's important to be honest with people, right? Um, I've always been one that I do not like to dilly-dally around, okay? If it's a tough talk, if it's a tough conversation, I don't want to dilly-dally around the con conversation. I want to get straight to the point. I remember being, I'm not going to, I remember being in a, at a school, and before we had this important parent meeting uh, with this family, and I remember that the plan, we have already talked about what was going to happen, okay? We already talked about what was going to happen, what, how we were going to handle the situation, and so we already knew the outcome that, that we were going to tell this family that this kid, uh, we just don't have the services to provide for this kid and that they need to find a better, a better um, school environment for the child. Um, we just couldn't provide the necessary needs. It was just too much and we just didn't have the resources. Okay, so it, wouldn't, it would not benefit this child to stay at the school. Obviously, by me saying this, you know I'm talking about Mount Dora Christian because we're a private school. Public school, you won't do that. <laughs> but private school, we just didn't have the resources. Okay, this kid needed more resources. And so we get into this meeting, and the person who was leading the meeting was dragging their feet, just going on and on and on. It's like, why are we, because how the person was talking, it was like providing a little bit of hope for this family, right? And it's like, what are we doing here? This is not the game plan, right? Uh, we just need to be honest with these people. I mean, it might hurt a little bit, but they're going to have a little bit more respect if you just are straight up with them about the situation, right? And being honest with them. And, and so as adult godly leaders... There's going to be what, what we call at Publix, as in our management training, we call them tough talks. There's going to be times in management and leadership that you're going to have to have tough talks. Right? You're going to have to have tough talks. And when you have those tough talks, sometimes you just have to be straight up honest. Right? When you beat around a bush, you don't tell the whole truth. It's going to catch up to you. Right? And, and so it's important for you to be honest. If, if you made a mistake, own up to it. Own up to it. One of the things that I do like about public supermarkets is it's, it has a high, like, honesty is like one of the top things there. Like, if you mess up, if you mess up as a manager... And I don't know how it is at the warehouse, Dwayne, but if you mess up big time as a manager, but you own up to your mistake, you might get demoted, okay? But if you, blatant, if you just blatant lie straight to the face, they fire you immediately because they don't want dishonest people. They want people to be honest about what's going on. And so when we're leaders, we need to be honest. We need to be honest about situations. There's going to be tough talks that, 
that an eldership has to have with people. Right? I mean, there's going to be tough talks um, that, that elders have to have. Um, and, and it's just, when you're in a leadership role, that just comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. But the important thing is to make sure that we are always telling the truth. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, I want us to look at verse 9 and 10. This is David here as he is talking to Solomon. And as we look here, we can see a culture of something that each generation of leaders helps to create. Okay? How we set up the next generation for success. Or we can set them up for failure. And so here is David instructing Solomon and giving him some words, right? What is said there in verse 9 and 10 of 1 Chronicles 28? All right, so first here, as we think, of, as we look here in, with David, as he's talking to his son, who he's getting ready to appoint to be the next leader, right? He tells him first to remember who his leader is. Who did David say Solomon's leader is? God. He told him, remember who your leader is. In life, we're always going to have some type of leader, right? But everybody answers to one. And that one leader is God. And God is who everybody answers to and, and who everybody will answer to, right? No matter what, people are going to answer to God. And so David here advised Solomon, remember who your leader is. God is your leader. You need to serve him. You need to obey him. You need to do all that he tells you to do. If you do these things, he will be with you. Right? I mean, and, and so, so he tells him this. Second, David advised Solomon to remember he is accountable. We are all accountable of ourselves. But, as elders, who are elders accountable for? What's that? Yeah? Who else are we accountable for? Are we accountable for the, I mean, are we, are we, um, how we shepherd the flock, right? As a man, who are we accountable for in our family? Are we accountable for our family? Yes. We're accountable on how we lead our family. Are we not? And, and so, so David advised Solomon to remember his accountability. Um, and so always remember that, that, that you are accountable to God. But third, David advised Solomon to remember that actions carry consequences. Actions carry consequences. Who better to give that advice than David? Right? Did not his actions carry a lot of consequences? I mean, you look at the, you look at the consequence that he had for having an affair with Bathsheba. You look at how David's life went after that. It was, from a family standpoint, it was a complete failure. From a family standpoint. Do you all agree with that? I mean, it was a failure. I mean, you think about that. I mean, his, the child died. But as David's children grew up, 
you look at the dysfunction in his family. I mean, you have one half-brother raping a half-sister, another half-brother killing a half-brother, another son looking to take reign over you and try to kill you and take your kingdom from you. I mean, it was complete dysfunction because of consequences. Because of the consequences that David had because of the actions that he took. And so here he is trying to give these words on. Look here, son. Understand, I know what consequences look like. I know what consequences are because of the actions that I've made. I'm trying to help you out here, son. There's going to be consequences if you make the wrong decisions. If you make the wrong decisions. And so these were just... Some of the points here that we can learn here from David as he's trying to cultivate the next culture of generation of leaders when it comes to solving as the next leader of the kingdom, trying to pass on that to him. Last chapter here, I said I'm going to get you out in 34 minutes and 30 seconds. I got 12 minutes. We're rolling right along here. We are going to get this done here. All right. Last chapter here, um, it kind of piggybacks on some stuff. But it is being accountable. Being accountable. In Genesis chapter 3, what happened in Genesis chapter 3? Because I know y'all, y'all are so wise. Y'all have so much wisdom. Y'all don't even need to open up your Bibles right now because I know you know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. What happened? What? Temptation, which led to what? Which led to sin. Adam and Eve, right? Did either one of those individuals want to take accountability? They blamed each other. They wanted to pass it on. Who did Adam want to blame? He wanted to blame God, right? That woman you gave me, this is what she did. God! How could you do this to me? How could you give me this woman? Right? Because she has, has, has caused me to eat this fruit. Being accountable. Being accountable. So, it's important for us to be accountable. September 6, 1943. Winston Churchill is there, and he's there at Harvard College. And as he's there at Harvard College, he said this. The price of greatness is responsibility. That is what Winston Churchill um, said um, that particular day. You know, many leaders try to avoid accountability because of fear of judgment. Because of fear of judgment, um, fear of what others might think, Fear of failure, they don't want to take accountability. You know, how can, as we look at this idea of cultivating a culture, how can, we, how can leaders create a culture of accountability? Number one, listen to your followers. Listen to your followers is one of the, one of the things that they can do. How often is it that, that maybe leaders have people that work underneath them, but the people that are working underneath are very specialized in something, a lot more specialized than what the leader is, right? And those people who are specialized in the stuff say, hey, we need to go here with this, and the leader just totally just ignores them. You're shaking your head because you know that in education. People on the front line, teachers on the front line, and you got people down sitting in offices down at the school board, the, the, uh, school board building making decisions on what's best in the classroom, and they haven't been in a classroom in 30 years. Or never been in a classroom. Okay? It's that way a lot in organizations. And, and so, in 1986, does anybody remember what big event happened in 1986? You got married, okay. Anybody remember something that happened in our country? Huh? The Challenger. 
Okay? So, on the particular day of the Challenger, that particular morning it was super cold in Cape Canaveral. And two of the engineers or, um, who, who was it? Two of the, um, two of, I'm trying to see how, let's see here. Two senior engineers, they went to the big shots and said, we need to postpone this flight. We need to postpone it. We do not need to do the liftoff this morning. Well, the big-time NASA officials ignored their plead to not do it. And we saw what happened with the Challenger. It's important that sometimes as leaders that we open our ears up and we listen to some of the people that we're leading. Because just because we're a leader doesn't mean we know it all. Just because the elders are elders in the church doesn't mean that they know it all. Right? And, and, and so sometimes we have to listen to those that we lead. Right? And, and, and so especially when there's areas that they are particularly strong at, that we are not strong at, um, it's important that we listen to people when it comes to that. Number two, and it kind of went on what we talked about on cultivating the culture, is admit your mistakes. Admit when you mess up. Go ahead and get it out there. Right? I remember, I think, I, I, I'm pretty sure I told y'all this story. It was like my beginning teaching years my, when I was teaching. I was teaching over at Crystal Springs Elementary School. And, and um, as I'm there, I, I have one of those days where it's just been a long day. And why in the world would they schedule kindergartners at the end of the day for my PE class? I had no idea. It's the worst. Whoever did that schedule ought to be ashamed of themselves. You don't give us kindergartners at the end of the day. Uh, you want to see a bunch of five-year-olds at 1.30 in the afternoon, 2 o'clock? They are off the chart. They're out of control. Okay, because they've already had a whole day. They took naps away from five-year-olds. They took naps away from kindergartners. Let's make these poor babies go to school all day from 8.30 to 3 o'clock with no nap. What is, what is going on with these people, right? They need their nap. They're still five years old, okay? And I remember that that entire class, they were driving me nuts. Coach, he won't be my friend. Coach, I got to go to the bathroom. Coach, coach. And it was just, and I already had one of these days, okay? And I'll never forget, I was in there with the other PE coach because he had a kindergarten class, I had one. So you're talking about 40 kindergartners all together in this, uh, in this room, okay? In this big old multi-purpose room. And I'm just like, I'm losing my mind. My head is going like this. Like, oh, I got to get rid of these kids. They're driving me nuts. And they just kept on and on and on. And I just lost my cool on them. Yes, I lost my cool on, on some five-year-olds. They wouldn't stop talking when we're trying to go over what to do. And I said, why don't you all just shut up? I said that. I'm telling you right now, you could hear a pin drop. They were like, I cannot believe he just said that. It was almost like, ooh, I'm telling. <laughs> okay, it's like they never heard that word before. And I knew, I said, oh, man, I can't believe I just said that. Okay. And so <laughs> the other coach, he just, he was like, oh, Josh, what did you do here? Um, and I remember when that class left, I said, I got to go talk to the principal. I got to go let her know. I got to cut this off in case she gets some phone calls. And I remember him telling me, Josh, no, don't. I got your back. You didn't say nothing. I said, I can't do it, man. I messed up. I got to pay the price. So I went and knocked on the door of the principal's office. I said, well, I just want to let you know I messed up. And I said, you might be getting some phone calls today <laughs> from parents. And said, what did you do? 
And I told her, she said, well, it could be a lot worse. <laughs> you could have said something else. <laughs> um, but she said, I appreciate you. She didn't get on to me. She said, I appreciate you coming to me and admitting that you messed up. I appreciate you doing that. That, comes, that. that says a lot about who you are. And so that was it. I mean, I guess she never got any phone calls. If she did, she never told me. Um, but we have to, as leaders, we have to be willing to admit when we make mistakes. Because guess what? We're human. We're going to mess up. No matter what your role is, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. Um, and so, um, so we need to be that. Number three, it says, being concerned without being controlled. Um, obviously, stress comes with leadership. Um, you can obviously expect criticism when you're a leader because everybody can do it better, right? Um, and so that's what everybody says. Well, if I was in that role, I would do this, 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 this. It would be so much better, right? Um, and, and so um, so being concerned with, without being in control, not allowing, um, um, not allowing other people to dictate how you're going to lead, right? Don't allow other people to control how you're going to lead the organization, right? Don't be afraid that somebody's going to get upset and leave. Um, one of the things I used to always say, um, I made this comment. I remember being in a, a and I'll say this, I'll say this. Um, I, when I was at Mount Dora Christian, I was in a lot of conversations uh, with, with leadership and I was in one on the school side of things, on leadership. And we was talking about, um, about what's being taught. Like, like, like we was talking about from a spiritual aspect of things, on what needs to be taught or whatever. And the other leadership besides me was more afraid about, well, how, because the majority of the student body was not members of the church. And so they were almost like, well, if we try to push this, this, and this, people might leave. And my comment was, let them. I said, you ain't going to go to a Catholic, I'm not going to go, if I want to take my girls to a Catholic school, if I went in there to that Catholic school for enrollment and say, hey, I'd like to sign my girls up, but we're not Catholic, we'll never be Catholic, I do not want you to push Catholic doctrine on them, I don't want you to say anything about the Catholic Church, you know what they're going to tell me? This is not the place for you. Oh, man, I didn't get you out 30 seconds early. Oh, man, I'm sorry. But we've got to not allow situations like that to control our decision making. We have to do what we know is right. No matter what the outcome is going to be, it's going to be. But we have to strive to to do what's right, and I don't know where I just placed my book at, but I guess that just means class is over, because I don't even know what I did with my book. Where did I do my book? To my right. Oh, it's right here, people. Oh, I'm losing my mind up in here, up in here. There was a song. Y'all going to make me lose my mind. <laughs> up in here, up in here. Um, anyways. Um, last point here, I, I, I'm over 30 seconds now, but that's all right. It's my last class. What are you going to do, fire me? Right? <laughs> I ain't here next week. Um, I am here, but just I won't be up here. Um, but remember, remember, as, as leaders, remember they need you. They need strong leadership. And so they need you. Um, and so in Matthew chapter 25, we have the parable of the talents, okay? When we think about this idea of being accountable, was the one talent man, he did not want to take accountability, did he? When, 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 he, when his master left, he gave him one talent, he did what with it? He hid it, didn't he? He hid it and did nothing with it, right? Um, because he didn't want to take accountability. Brothers and sisters, and brothers and sisters, I'm telling you all, we're going to have to take accountability. Because on the day of judgment, we're going to be accountable for how we live our life. We're going to have to stand before God. Thank you so much for um, your attention this quarter.
I appreciate it. Uh, remember, Sunday mornings, I want you to challenge David Compton. I want him sweating. Y'all think I'm playing. I want him sweating in his shoes up there. So put the pressure on him. Have some important, tough questions for him because I want to see him sweat. This is going to be beautiful. Oh, hey, buddy. How's it going? Uh, anyways, y'all have a good